I like to eat my do own, own dog food here, so we're about to, uh, I'm going to push a button here and hopefully we'll get some full screen. Did anything happen there? Full screen API, well, it's getting there. It's not quite perfect yet. I'm going to stick with that for now. So thanks for coming along. Thanks for uh, coming and thinking about the web and the awesome things it can do. Thanks to James for uh, laying down, throwing down the gauntlet. Uh, and I'm going to try and respond uh, in the same spirit as James's um, presentation there. Now, James observed, he said, well, John's got to come and, he speak, and speak about accessibility. And, and, and you know what? I'm not. I'm not going to talk about those things. I have a fundamental belief about what the world is, uh, what the web is, and what makes something to web. And I know there are a lot of people in the room, my very good friend Jeremy Keith is over there, uh, who would definitely agree with me. So to me and to many others, I know the web is something more, much more than just what runs in the browser. It's, it's more than what we simply build with web technologies. It's the openness and the interoperability, these things that make the web what it is. And so to me, approaches to developing for the web, which are inherently antithetical to those values um, and principles, are to me not really about the web. But that's a philosophical position, and I don't want to talk about that today. I want to talk about some very practical and pragmatic things. So let's think for a moment about what we build when we build for the web. For the most part, we continue to largely build what we might consider to be traditional websites. That's the vast majority of the content of the web, and I think it will be for a long time to come. It's document-centric, although increasingly it does have a more interactive, more application-like experience to it as well. And we're also in frequently now building more application-like, uh, more uh, less document-like experiences. Now, this has been happening for quite a long time, as James observed, all the way back to having our first input elements. Uh, but for, as he observes, for most of that time, much of the application logic has relied, resided on a server, and our clients were, have been pretty dumb. That's partly a, a reality of the, of the technology we had at the time, and partly we were stumbling towards understanding how to build these things with the technologies we had. And in recent years, though, and, and although things like Google Maps and Gmail have shown we've been doing this for quite a while, uh, we've had more client-side application sophistication. And that, of course, was particularly aided by the rise of Ajaxian techniques, the ability to send not just whole states, but little pieces of information to and from the server. And then in the last three or four years in particular, and I think it has, as James Azur, been uh, driven in, in no small part by the success of mobile application platforms like iOS and Android, we've seen rise in this expectation amongst users that particularly our mobile applications, which run in the browsers, should be more native-like. So in response to this, a particular architecture, a particular set of practices has emerged to build these kind of more native-like applications. We might refer to that as the single page application. And what we've found when we're developing these single page applications is that there are particular challenges to developing with them. In particular, as James observed, two things really importantly are performance and the ability for applications to work offline. Now, I'd just like to, before we continue, to note that even if all of these concerns are completely true and that there are no alternatives to addressing these shortcomings of, of the traditional web technologies for building single-page applications, when we focus on them, we're only focusing on a small subset of all the types of application that we are building for the web and into the future will build for the web. And we're also focusing on a certain historical set of circumstances. For example, currently poor browser engines, particularly in Android, uh, in the lack of just-in-time compilers in web views in iOS, the first iteration of app cache, which you know, is a bit of a douche, as we'll probably hear a bit later on. Um, you know, this is a it's an historical set of circumstances that will pass. There is this thing called Moore's Law. So I think it's very important not to focus on just a certain moment in history and to decry the lack in what we have. As I said, I'm not saying what James, the, the, the criticisms James outlined are not real and they're not painful and they don't need solving. Right? It's understandable when we have this frustration and we have to solve a specific problem, we look to make something new and to break with what we see as the shackles of the past, to get it right this time. 
But what I'm going to suggest over the next half an hour or so is that we need to be really careful when we look to make profound changes to systems that have served us very well for quite a long time. All right. Is the web showing us age or has it got a robustness and maturity that we would be very wise not to simply throw away? Now, I feel this for two key reasons. There's a trite one. Uh, if you've read The Mythical Man Month by Fred Brooks, you'll know about the second system effect. Uh, and I think when I see calls to reboot the web, which aren't entirely uncommon these days, I'm, I'm mindful of, of Brooks' observation of this second system effect. And he observes that there's a general tendency to over-design the second system, using all the ideas and frills that were cautiously sidetracked the first time around. But that's a bit trite, quoting Fred Brooks. So I'm going to quote a far more important uh, authority on stuff, Johnny Mitchell. <laughs> all right. So when we try to solve a specific problem, and I will observe, again, I think that a lot of what we are, the pain we are feeling is a specific historical problem that will actually kind of go away uh, by itself in some ways. By throwing out many years of robust and solid and well thought out, well understood technologies and patterns just to solve that problem, we should be very careful to at least think about what we're throwing away when we just inject everything into the body to be a little bit trite again. Now, I'm going to be very upfront here. Most of the rest of this presentation is inspired by an amazing presentation by a guy called Rich Hickey, who uh, developed the language closure, which goes to show just he's about four orders of magnitude smarter than I am. Uh, if you've not seen it, you should go and find it and watch it. It was a keynote that he did at Strange Loop a couple of years ago. You should really just go and watch that. It's amazing. And if you haven't picked it up yet, this is the... This presentation is really about software engineering and the web. And very, very briefly, I have been doing software since the 1980s. This is not an argument from authority, by the way. It's an argument from simply an old guy. <laughs> and you know, I have a traditional computer science background in many ways, and I've built desktop applications, I've built web applications. So you know, these, are the th these are the things that I've been grounded in. And I think there's a lot to learn from traditional software engineering. So I'm going to be quoting some people like Fred Books and some people like Dijkstra quite a lot and people like Hickey. Now Hickey's observation is that we as developers have this tendency to conflate something being easy with something being simple and that these are actually profoundly different things. Simplicity and obviously complexity is a feature of what we build. It's a feature of our code and he observes that the origins of the word simple come from the Latin to mean single-folded, as opposed to complexity, which comes, uh, it, its original term meant many-folded or braided or intertwined. Now, easiness, on the other hand, is a subjective experience that we as developers feel, and it's actually unrelated to the simplicity or the complexity of what we build. But we as developers think when something is difficult and it's complex, when it's not actually the same thing. As Dijkstra notes uh, in, in one of his famous essays, simplicity is hard work, but absolutely vital to building reliable systems. But he goes on to observe, obviously, complexity sells better, right? This is why there are management consulting companies. This is why there is SAP. <laughs> now, there are many great quotations about simplicity. We, we all know many of them. They're from Einstein and, and Leonardo, Frank Lloyd White, right? Everyone's probably got their favorite one. But here's my favorite one. It's from the master Bruce Lee. It is not a daily increase, but a daily decrease, he says, of simplicity. Hack away at the inessentials. How awesome Bruce Lee talked about hacking. The original hacker. Now, we know, we've known, and when I say we, I mean people who build complex software systems have known for a long time that complex systems become increasingly expensive over their life cycle. They take longer and longer to build and are often not completed at all. And we know that once we have a complex system, adding new features is really difficult. And we know maintaining complex system is really hard. And I'm going to argue that we've got away on the web with not paying enough attention to issues like complexity 
for too long when we build things for the web, particularly on the client side. And I think that's for a number of reasons. And this might be challenging, or maybe the rocks have been reserved for me, but for a long time, what we've been building for the web has been intrinsically quite simple. And a lot of what we build is actually quite trivial, and that's not exactly the same thing. So the complexity of a system and its implications have kind of been hidden for us. And probably the most important thing in some ways for this is that for a long time on the web, we've been used to just throwing things away and starting all over again, rather than having to maintain systems over long periods of time. In the world of traditional software, you simply can't get away with complexity. Many systems are decades old. We heard of Y2K, right? Some of you may not remember that, you'll be young now. But it was a big deal 12 years ago. And it was a big deal because we had these systems that were built in the late 60s and early 70s, still running our airports and our banks and our hospitals, right? Systems last a long time. So how many of the things you've built, we build, even last for years, right? So for the most of the history of the web, the tools we've had at our disposal to develop with have been quite simple. We've used HTML for our documents and our content. We've used CSS to style that. And we've used JavaScript and the DOM to add behavior to that and, and to add a dynamism to our content. But using these technologies, as simple as they are, isn't necessarily easy for a couple of reasons. Sometimes because it's the underlying ways in which they work, for example with CSS, is quite different from what most people would expect. So if you think about the way that CSS works, it's different from the way most development technologies work. And we as developers think, well, you know, this is a bit of a bug, it's too simple, and we invent things like SAS, which I'm gonna come back to a little later. And sometimes what we've been doing hasn't been easy because of the implementation of the technologies we've been working with. They've been inconsistent. That's uh, one of our great challenges, that we actually have multiple targets to hit, where almost no other developers have that. They can hit Objective-C, you know, they, they've got one platform, they've got, you know, they've got the I iOS, right? And if they go from iOS 5 to 6, all of a sudden there's a gap at the top of the wrap, right? And this is a disaster in that world, right? So one of our challenges, look, if, if there'd only ever been Internet Explorer 6, our life would have been easier, right? It would have been easier, but would it have been better? So, over time, we as developers have added these layers of technology and practice to help address the difficulty of developing for the web. Now, I'm not going to say any of these or all of these are bad, but they add complexity. So, we stumbled on user agent sniffing, which made addressing the challenge of cross-browser inconsistency easier to deal with. And we developed CSS hacks to target different browsers with the same CSS code base. Now, these things aren't really needed anymore, but they add complexity to learning to be a web developer and to maintaining code bases. And we added doc type switching to allow us to develop a single CSS code base that would work in all these old browsers as well as the newer standards based browsers. It sounds like ancient history. All this added a complexity that continues to impact us to this day. Your code is still full of ta the Tantec hack, right? People still use the FADA image replacement technique. Right, there's all this stuff that we build to solve historically short-term problems that add complexity to last for a very long time. And that doesn't just last in what we build, it lasts in our practice altogether. So we developed these things to address a challenge at the time. Browser pages should look and work the same across all modern browsers. And now, not only is this a belief we don't hold very strongly anymore, Indeed, as we address these new challenges and opportunities of fragmented uh, viewing contexts, small mobile devices, tablets, desktops, laptops, high resolution monitors, true HD, we've in fact rejected the idea altogether, but the complexity that we developed to deal with what we thought was an historical problem is actually still with us. And it's a function of premature optimization. We have to keep in mind complexity has a very long half-life. And so when we add it, we have to be very careful about the decision to do so. 
So with the rise of web applications around a decade ago, we encountered the challenge of inconsistent DOM implementations. Now, we already actually had encountered that earlier with the HTML, uh, but they were relatively simple, uh, and in fact, as essentially one browser gained complete control over a marketplace, it became less of a problem. But then with the emergence of browsers other than Internet Explorer 6, we had this problem all over again. And so all of a sudden we developed Prototype and Dojo and MooTools and jQuery and other monolithic JavaScript libraries that helped us manage this challenge of inconsistent implementations. But for good measure they imp implemented all these new features to make JavaScript and the DOM better, right? But they implemented them inconsistently. So they made our lives easier, but they added complexity as well. So on top of learning JavaScript and the DOM, we needed to learn the features and concepts and often new syntaxes of, of in, in many cases, multiple libraries, right? And then we had to worry about versioning. What happens when our libraries update? What's going to happen now? And then we needed to start considering about the impact on performance of having these relatively large files. So we invented concepts like minifying and, 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 and so on to reduce the impact on the performance of our applications. We added a lot of complexity. And what about now? We have CSS frameworks, we've got preprocessors, we've got languages which compile to JavaScript, we've got MVC libraries, we've got templating libraries, we've got UI libraries, we've got foundational libraries like jQuery and Zepto, we've got boilerplates, we've got build, build tools. <sighs> you think that's bad, right? And then we've got meta tool sets like, like Yeoman and boilerplates for helping us work with all these other tool sets, and then to use them you need Ruby on Rails or Node.js set up. <sighs> and this is just for client-side development. So we've just had a look at a, a path we've been travelling along over the last 15 years or so as web developers, and I think it's a slippery path of ever-increasing complexity, and it's mostly in service of ostensible ease. It's mostly to make our life, what we think, is easier. Now, as I said, I'm old, and I've been around the block a few times, and I've seen, i even done mini-computer programming back in the day. Right. So I frequently come back to this uh, observation. You've heard in one form or another, in fact, it, it, it's found at the, at the memorial in Auschwitz in one form, um, by George Satayana. Progress, far from consisting in change, depends on retentiveness. When change is absolute, there remains no being to improve and no direction is set for possible improvement. And when experience is not retained, infancy is perpetual. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. So who's heard of the software crisis? Right, this was the biggest deal back in the day. In fact, it was a term that was coined in 1968 at the first ever NATO software engineering co conference. Now, NATO and software crisis strike a pretty big problem if it involves missiles, right? Because it did. These systems people were building were pointing planet-destroying arsenals of nuclear weapons at each other and controlling it all by software, right? So that's why they called it a crisis, all right. About this, some years later, Dijkstra wrote, the major cause of software crisis is that the machines have become several of orders of magnitude more powerful, right? Think about that. Software is harder not because computers are simple but because they are getting better. To put it bluntly, as long as there were no machines, programming was not a problem at all. It was called maths. Right? When we had a few weak computers, programming became a mild problem. And now we have gigantic computers, programming has become an equally gigantic problem. Right? Does it sound a bit like what happens with us in the browser as they get better performance and more features? I, I, by the way, this is not a very long paper. You can go find it online. In fact, I think all you can do is find a scanned PDF that's actually an image. Um, you should read it. It's, it's, it's well worth a read, I think. And, and Dijkstra is one of the greats of our industry. Although, um, uh, famously, someone described the units of arrogance uh, in our field as uh, nano dijkstras. I think that was, uh, it was, it was Kay, I think, um, who, who described it. Anyway, was that right? Yeah, yeah nano dijkstras. So, but I am quoting him quite a lot because I think uh, he had a lot to say. Now, Dijkstra's response to this ever-increasing uh, situation of complexity was a counterintuitive one at the time, which was to simplify not to make things easier. So how did 
the software engineering world will respond to this. And James has, has, has flagged this. The principal concern, uh, the principal term, the principal concept that emerged in software engineering, the foundation really of software engineering is the idea of separation of concerns, which we all more or less know what that is. I think you've, you've seen reference to it, but it's a lot older than our particular branch of software engineering. Does it sound familiar? You know that thing that some web folks, have been, some of them in this room have been banging on about since the 1990s? You've got your HTML for content, you've got CSS for presentation, you've got JavaScript for behavior. Not only was this good practice, right? It was actually baked directly into the core technologies of the web. When we use these technologies in the way they are designed, we get separation of concerns out of the box. We get it for free, right? And is a very good understanding about why separation of concerns is important. And yet, we do things like what James showed us, right? Where there's all this JavaScript that we pull in and then we've got an empty body element. And this is what goes in that empty body element, right? There's some HTML, there's some CSS, there's some JavaScript, all in there, there's a point. It's all in there. And then, you've probably seen the brand new Instagram kind of web client, which looks really smart. Well, as Remy pointed out to me a couple of days, go and have a look, John. And in fact, inside there, you see this giant, most of the content is just a giant blob of JSON. Now, we're all used to hitting the server and getting a JSON string back and, and then populate and planning something with it. That's fine. This is just the value of a variable directly in the HTML, right? That is almost all the content of the page is there like that. Good luck debugging that. And then we have Websites, right? So this is Read Write Web. They've got this brand new bootstrap based thing. It's got 19 iframes on the average page. And it's got 20 scripts on the average page. And of course, it's built with bootstrap, right? It's just a website, people. Why are we overcomplicating these things, right? I, I, I fail to see any reason why they've gone and built this in that way. Right? So it's not just single page applications here. This is infecting everything and everyone, right? Everything's getting built with this Twitter bootstrap right now, right? Everything starts with mobile or HTML5 boilerplate, right? Every website now is going to start, we push Yeoman, right? <laughs> That's it, right? Our job's done now, right? Now, the danger is that I'll just look so, like some crank. I guess I've got young children, I'm used to that. Um, but this isn't just a set of beliefs. It's not about some sort of purity. Complexity has costs. The first one I think is really important we often overlook is to have a genuine profession, a genuine field of, of endeavour, you need it to be learnable, right? We already have a real shortage of people coming into the industry. There's a crisis, right? Anyone can go to Silicon Valley now and get paid $150,000 a year to, if they know anything about JavaScript, basically, right? And this is what, again, Dijkstra had to say. He said, for the first challenge for computing science is to discover how to maintain order in a finite but very large discrete universe that is intricately intertwined. All right, so he's talking about how we manage complexity. But he says, a second but not less important challenge is how to mould what you have um, achieved in solving the first problem into a teachable discipline. It does not suffice to hone your own instinct. He observes that goes to, goes to the grave with you, right? That's actually in the quote. You must teach others how to hone theirs. Teaching yourself is discovering what is teachable. Once a time, at the time when we were you know, becoming web developers, think about how you became a web developer. The approach to learning was you know, learned some principles of a markup with HTML. You learned some foundations of CSS and over time began to master it. You might learn a bit of JavaScript and, and, and DOM programming, probably by using jQuery a lot of the time. Right? And you could view source and work out how something had been built. Now, that's not to say this is perfect and the only way we should do things, but it is to observe this has worked for a very long time. It's worked very well. It's what's produced our industry. Right? How many people in this room, essentially, that's how you became a web developer, right? So it strikes me, right, it strikes me that we discard this stuff at our peril, right? We've got to make a very careful choice because that's what we're doing. We're making choices about what our profession looks like, what our field looks like. And let's compare this with the single page application style of development. Now, developers need to be increasingly very good at JavaScript. James would 
it would seem, at least from the, his most extreme position that he took, I appreciate that was a rhetorical one in many ways, essentially all you have to be good at is JavaScript. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't be good at JavaScript, right? But it's not just about JavaScript. It's you have to have a strong knowledge of specific frameworks and then build tools and a heap of other stuff as well, right? Think about the impact on workflow and the way our teams worked. When concerns were strictly separated, we had markup, we had presentation, we had behavior, then working on each in isolation with specialized skills or areas of focus was far, he far easier than having all these concerns intertwined. And this is just a little one, but build cycles, right? So I'm old fashioned, but the ability to load a page and refresh it every time I tweak some CSS, some HTML, some JavaScript, without having to worry about the edit, compile, run, crash, debug, edit, compile, traditional software kind of paradigm, to me is frankly a miracle. Let alone, you know, having to set up and install, install your build systems and all your tools and your Ruby gems. And, we're making things incredibly complicated. But ironically, I'm falling into the trap that Rich Hickey's observed, that I'm talking about what's easy for me and us as developers. And I'm talking about the process, not about the simplicity or complexity of what we're building. So let's turn to that issue and see what impact of some of the choices we're making about how we build today is having on the complexity of what we build. So one thing that is challenging with complexity is debugging. We make simple mistakes like typo errors, right? We do it all the time, it's, we have checkers and that, that, that stuff catches these things. But really we do complex things. And bugs that are difficult to fix are really subtle. They don't generally throw syntax errors, they just do weird stuff. And they're difficult to reproduce because of the stateful nature of a lot of development. What that means is the same code can produce different outcomes based on the state of the system it's applied to. So if you look at CSS, as developers, it's, it's long been a cause of frustration, errors and bugs. But at least the bugs are e reproducible and deterministic. You take this HTML and this CSS and it gives the same DOM with the same values, right? So with CSS and HTML, discovering why this element has these properties set to these values is relatively straightforward. Our tools are well adapted to this problem. The truth is it's not a particularly complicated problem. But when we start changing the DOM, programmatically, that becomes a totally different situation. Now, I'm not going to suggest that we never programmatically change the DOM. But I'd argue that we should do this as a last resort, and only when it is essentially impossible to do that with CSS and HTML alone. And in order to make the decision as to whether that's impossible or not, you really need to understand HTML and CSS well. Not just their syntax, but their essence. So here's a quote not from Dijkstra or from Fred Brooks, but uh, Eugene Wallingford, who's a, um, who doesn't have quite as sexy a name, I guess, so that's why he doesn't get down in the pantheon of software engineers. So he teaches computer science in the, in the United States. And he observes that to obtain the deepest benefit from learning a new language, you must learn to think in the new language. Not just learn to translate your favorite programming language syntax and idioms into it. That's, a, that's what it is to master, right? So what we've seen of late is this explosion in languages which target JavaScript. CoffeeScript, I guess, is, is the most recent and most dominant example. But what this does is introduce all these significant challenges to us as individuals and to our whole field, right? So learnability. Can you just know CoffeeScript and not JavaScript, right? That's, I don't know, is there an answer to that? But it particularly impacts on debuggability. Without source maps, more complexity, the challenge of debugging returns to the stone age of console.log. The tools we've built and the practice we've developed over years to help make building websites and applications more robust, they're being obviated overnight, right? So I don't have to type as much, right? So it's because I don't want to deal with how hard this is in JavaScript, right? Now, in and of themselves, each of the innovations that we've made over the last 20 years, CoffeeScript, SAS, and MVC frameworks, and the tools that we uh, build, each of them may appear to bring, and do bring, much. And the case can be made in exchanging some ease for some of the additional but manageable complexity. But as we pile innovation on innovation, 
We have an increasingly fragmented, non-interoperable, fragile stack of technologies that rely on one another. So I need Node.js to use Yeoman to install this thing. But I think there's a far bigger issue lurking just uh, beyond debuggability. Debuggability is only a part of it. I talked briefly about maintainability. On the web, particularly the front end, we're used to throwing things away and starting all over again with alarming frequency. We build all kinds of one-off, essentially disposable apps, throw it against the wall, see if it has traction, move on. Uh, and let's face it, in particular, native-like single-page applications that we build often don't really do all that much. That's not a criticism, but that's the reality of, of mobile applications. They often don't do a great deal. But as more and more of what was traditionally desktop software, of client server software, and mobile software becomes web-based, this luxury of build to dispose, if it hasn't already, will soon pass. And it's well known from the last 50 years of software engineering that rewriting applications, rather than incrementally improving them, is highly correlated with very negative outcomes. Some of the most significant applications, indeed companies of their time, have essentially vanished because of massive rewrites that never quite got done. On the web, we've had the experience of Netscape, which ceded about a decade's worth of control to Internet Explorer precisely because they started all over again. Now, you could argue, well, Firefox rose from those ashes, but I would argue that essentially Firefox was the entirely new product that started. And so if effectively that, that pain that we had for half a decade was because, in no small part, Netscape just decided to start all over again. So I have to ask us, are we building for maintainability? Are we choosing technologies that will be around for a long time? Right? Something being old doesn't just mean it's tired, it also means it's robust and well understood. And are we choosing technologies which are widely understood and will be for the foreseeable future? Or are we forever chasing the new? Are we failing to learn from the past? Are we really just focusing on the problems we have today and thinking we have to throw everything out and start all over again? Are we, in short, condemning ourselves to perpetual infancy? By the way, everything I'm talking about applies not just to JavaScript. I think it applies to a lot of the things that we're doing. So, Let's take something like less or SAS. But the same thing applies to CoffeeScript and so on. What we're trying to do is essentially shoehorn into JavaScript or into CSS idioms and ideas and principles which aren't core to them. We aren't core to how we build for the web. Remember that quote that I had before. You must learn to think in the new language, not just to translate your favourite programming language syntax and idioms into it. But what I really think we're doing here, and this is where I get positive <laughs> for the next little while, is we're missing one of the great revolutionary aspects of developing for the web. It is declarative, particularly when you use HTML and CSS, but I think we're going to see the rise and rise of functional JavaScript. And functional JavaScript, uh, functional programming, is a form of declarative programming. So James mentioned briefly, and I think that's interesting how many of the things we've talked about have woven together despite the fact that we didn't actually manage to get the time to sit down and chat about this before. Um, if you're not familiar with it, there are two, well, there are a number of paradigms of programming that have emerged over the last 50 years or so. And probably the two most dominant are imperative programming and um, declarative programming. And what you probably most think of when you think of programming is imperative programming. Imperative programming is telling a computer how to do something, right? So if you think about classic JavaScript, you, you declare a variable and you loop and you, you change things. Right? So with imperative programming, we have statefulness and we have variables and we have side effects. And all of these things are well known to cause all sorts of challenges when developing robust, maintainable systems. So we compare that with declarative program, which you're doing all the time, which is what HTML and CSS are all about. It's stateless. And it has no, so this statefulness is a little bit different from the sense of statelessness of HTTP, by the way. Right? So just um, it's not exactly the same as, as that statelessness. But when you develop, we have no side effects. You have determining deterministic outcomes. I referred to this a moment ago. When you take this HTML and this CSS, you get this DOM, right? 
So it's about specifying what the computer should do. And it is, as I mentioned, real, it's well known to be associated with more robust, more maintainable, more debuggable systems. And we, we want to throw all that out? Why? For our own convenience, more or less. Because we're not willing to learn the idioms of these languages. We just want them to be something else. So I'll give you an example, SAS. Right? Just to prove this isn't all about JavaScript. Now, CSS is a declarative programming paradigm. You state what you want to happen in various conditions, and when those conditions occur, the browser applies the CSS. There are no side effects. It's deterministic. The same CSS on the same DOM tree determines the outcome every time, right? Which makes things a lot simpler, and they make them a lot more debuggable and ultimately a lot more maintainable. So what about SAS? Well, you know, CSS is lacking all this programming stuff that we really think is awesome. So we have variables and loops and calculations and we have methods and we've introduced statefulness. We've made it an imperative programming language when it's not. So we've snuck in there, purely for our own benefit, by the way, because ultimately it ends up as a CSS file. We've snuck in there a completely different paradigm. We're not using CSS with its fundamental idioms and its way. We're trying to turn it into something else for our own benefit. And what are we giving up in return? We've made applications that are harder to debug, they're less readable, they're less maintainable. And that doesn't even include all the work we have to do to set up build systems and maintain those build systems. And think about the, con the consequences for what we're building and our process of building. We have a total lock-in into the future for one non-standard, even if widely adopted technology, we've got a vastly diminished pool of people who can work on this project. We have a significantly increased complexity in debugging, and we have significantly increased development environment and, in fact, production environment complexity. All right, we have to manage versioning, and we have to, I mean, there's a whole heap of stuff there. And we've made our field more complex. And why are we doing this? All right, okay, I said enough negativity. What I'm not, calling for us to do is, is to not, it's not to not innovate. It's not to not explore. It's not to not do things. I know double negatives are challenging, but uh, I want to still do stuff like, um, you know, the um, web components. I want to still see innovation. I love that stuff. But it's a, it's a call to start appreciating the real nature of what we're doing. Increasingly, the web is the platform for enterprise, consumer, client server, mobile, pretty much all kinds of application. I mean, James points out that, you know, really, well, we've got this great battle against, uh, on our hands against Android and iOS and other mobile platforms, and I think, to some extent, that's very true. But by the same token, he observes that, in fact, mobile web use of Facebook is greater than the use of all mobile app combined. So the truth is, the web doesn't seem to be losing much of its ground out there. And I think it's only gaining ground in a lot of places. The web's long status as a toy, because it is, trust me, when you talk to most academic researchers and so on, they think it's a toy, or at best a publishing medium, has given us also the upside of not having this harsh glare of criticism being turned on what we do. And that's not going to last. The things we build are going to be required to do more and more, not just have more functionality, but last longer and be more robust and more secure and more performant. And we have to grow up and take these challenges seriously as a profession. Now, the good news is we have foundations for this. We have HTML and CSS and JavaScript and the DOM. And we have these increasingly sophisticated JavaScript engines and just-in-time compilers. And we have some of the smartest computer scientists in the world competing with each other on engines in Opera and WebKit, multiple engines in WebKit, in Firefox and in Windows, in, in, in Internet Explorer. Right? So we, we have incredible uh, innovation happening in that space. And of course, we're having uh, more and more capability given to us through HTML5 and related device APIs and so on. So I'm going to argue that it is not time to turn our back on these things, to wish we could do the web over again and again, to boil the ocean. Good engineering is about making well-researched and reasoned decisions about the tools and technologies we use for the specific purposes we are using them, which means really understanding the technologies and not relying on tools and scaffolding and syntactic sugar. And now I don't think, I believe very strongly, it's not the time to seek out easiness 
at the price of increasing complexity of the systems that we build. We all know, although I think sometimes we forget, that development is much more than writing code. Reducing the number of keystrokes may feel like we're being more efficient and productive, but I think we're measuring the wrong thing. What we really need to be measuring is the complexity of our systems, and we need to be measuring the robustness of our systems. So now is not the time to seek out easiness at the price of increasing the complexity of the systems we build. It's a time, I think, really to double down on the technologies that we have, continuing to improve them, all the while understanding what makes them so powerful. It's time for the web to take its place at the grown-ups table, and it's the responsibility of people like us in this room to make that happen. So I ask you not to throw away that legacy, those 20 years, not to throw away that responsibility and that opportunity, which is ours. Thank you very much.